I was privileged uh, last week to speak to a variety of people in the country of India, the state of Tamil Nadu, which is way down in the southern part of that large country where one billion people live. I got to visit the parishes of a pastor friend of mine who serves there, and he serves five different churches, which is customary for a lot of Lutheran Indian pastors, and so they really put us American pastors to shame. And this pastor's Sunday schedule is as follows. He has a a 5 a.m. service, a 6 a.m. service, an 8 a.m. service, a 10 a.m. service, and then a 5 p.m. service. He was gracious and told me I didn't have to show up for the 5 a.m. service, uh, to which I gave him a hearty thanks. But he gets up, and he goes, and he preaches, but he said, according to India standard time, really those services only start whenever the pastor gets there. That's when they start. But of all of those different churches, it was great to be able to speak to God's children on the other side of the world. I don't know if you've had this experience before, but... I spoke through a translator, and my translator this time happened to be my friend, Pastor Raji. I don't really trust Pastor Raji a whole lot, (laughs) and yet I told the people, I have to trust him today. I have to trust him, but he has a lot of power in what he's saying because he would translate, and I had no clue what he was saying. So I hope, I hope that the message got across. Well, today the message that is before us I'd like to focus on is one passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul is is talking to the people of God in the city of Corinth, people who were easily divided from one another. They were taking sides over different issues. They were saying that they were following different human leaders. And Paul, in his letter letter of 1 Corinthians, lifts up Jesus Christ and says, He alone must be the center of who we are. And in verse number 18 of 1 Corinthians 1, he says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God. It was a tremendous opportunity I was given last week to go to India and see the power of the cross at work in transforming and saving people's lives, even amidst a culture that is filled with people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. God is doing His work. He's saving people's lives through Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. The main purpose of my trip to India this time was to go and to celebrate the new construction of a new building for the Calvary India Mission Tailoring Center. You've probably heard me talk about the tailoring center before, and we in our mission dollars at Mount Olive are funding that tailoring center as it continues to equip young women to learn the skills needed uh, to be tailors and seamstresses. We were able, while I was there, to interview uh, some of the 10 ladies who went through the first group that came through, and then also to conduct interviews for people who were applying for the next group, which we then welcomed in. So it was great to meet some of the people who have sewing machines, thanks to many families in our midst, and to ask them, what are you doing with the skills that you learned? Several people said, we're able to sew clothes for our kids and save a a large amount of money by doing that. Others said they were able to get jobs in the factories in that town. Others said that they were able to do some side jobs while they stayed at home raising their children, that people always needed work on their clothes, and they were able now to do that. So they were given a skill that enables them to serve others in love, that enables them to provide well for their family, and it was a great blessing. Well, as we came to the construction of this new building, I'd like to show you a picture of Pastor Raji looking up at the building from the outside. He's standing next to a man named Deva Raj. Deva Raj is the general contractor, if you will, for the construction of the new building of the tailoring center. The construction has been delayed in the past several months because there's been a money crisis in India. As a matter of fact, as I drove around in India, every ATM had a huge line of 50, sometimes even over 100 people waiting to withdraw money. The government is trying to give new currency out that is less prone to counterfeiting, but in so doing, they, they, they haven't got it totally figured out how to do it. So people are limited to $40 a day to withdraw from their bank accounts. So they're constantly having to go back to the bank in order to try to find money. But sometimes those ATMs have a sign posted saying, out of order. 
So the money crisis has delayed the construction process, but it soon should be done, and the work is going on as we speak. The general contractor, Deva Raj, is a Hindu man, and you can see him dressed there in what is considered a, a swami garb, where he was in a period of, of fasting and praying for 30 days. He's a leader in the Hindu community there in Amber, Tamil Nadu, India. I had a chance to go with him actually one day during a Hindu feast and to see them and what they do to listen to their chanting, to watch their different ways that they bow before an idol. And as they celebrate and as they worship and as they have such devotion, my heart broke as I saw them worshiping a false god. And I was reminded of what our Scriptures for us today speak about light shining in the darkness and the importance of, of Christ being lifted up in a place where many people don't know Him. That's why we're building this new tailoring center. You can see the construction of a man hanging on the outside of the building, and he's painting the outside of this new tailoring center. They love to have their picture taken. As he's strapped there and harnessed there, he's painting the red. They asked me, what color should the, the, the outline of the, of the structure be? And I said, oh, clearly this color right here. And they don't have a good word for it, but it was St. Louis Cardinal Red. And so it looked really nice. <laughs> looks really good on this building. So they started painting this building as construction is taking place. And then you can see what it looks like in, in full here on the next picture. It's roughly about four stories high. And so the first floor is a, a room where the tailoring students will be doing their work at their sewing machines and learning from their two teachers. The second floor is a place where mission teams will be able to go and stay in um, hotel-type rooms with, with bathrooms and gathering area. The third floor are family quarters, and then the fourth floor is really just a, an open rooftop where the husbands have to go when their wives kind of kick them out to take a walk, right? But it's an open-air rooftop from which in this high structure you can look out over the whole city. Pastor Raji, as he was meeting with the general contractor, Deva Raj, he said to him, he said, I know that you are Hindu and that many of the workers here in this building are Hindu, and I respect you and I know you respect me. But he said, I would ask that as you build this building, you won't take part in a bunch of, of Hindu traditions of different prayers and chants at different phases along the way. But instead, Christian pastors are going to come and they'll pray blessings over the doors and blessings over the rooms along the way. Because this, Pastor Raji emphasized, is a place for Christian ministry. This is a place where we are responding to Jesus' love. We communicated to that, that, uh, this to that man from afar. And when we got there and saw the building, we were surprised to see the addition that the Hindu, Hindu general contractor had made atop the building. Do you see it? It's a large cross. It's a large cross that stands atop this building, and you can see it from blocks away as people are driving through this town in India. They are seeing the cross of Christ lifted high as a reminder of what our life is all about, Jesus Christ. You know, when we consider what God's Word says to us this morning about the cross of Christ being the power of God, we can view the cross like a lens. I went up to the top of the building and I looked out through that cross and was able through that cross to look out into the city. And what a reminder it is for us of how God first looks at us. That God looks at us through the lens of the cross. That when God as our Creator and as our Father above looks at us, He knows us inside and out. He knows us with all of our weakness, all of our brokenness, all of our failures. And yet when He looks upon us as people who have been clothed in the forgiveness of Christ, He doesn't see us because of our sin. He sees us because of His Son and His forgiveness. That when He looks at you, He sees you covered in Jesus who lived perfectly, who died sacrificially, and rose triumphantly for you. That the cross is the means by which God looks at His people. And so if the cross is the lens through which God looks at us, maybe it can also serve as a lens through which we look at other people. The message of the cross is foolishness to people who are perishing, dying in their sins, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What difference does it make in your life when you look through the cross of Jesus at other people? 
When you see another person, not as another person, but as another person for whom God gave the life of his son. As another person whom God desires to come to him through the forgiveness of sins and to know Jesus Christ for all eternity. The lens of the cross, God looks at you. The lens of the cross, you can look at someone else. Your spouse, your kids, your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, your family members. Anyone you meet through the lens of of the cross. In India, I needed to remind myself of that wherever I went because people look at you differently when you look like me and you walk in India. Several times I was in groups numbering thousands of people and I realized after walking around that I was the only Caucasian. So you can imagine how people look at a guy who's about six foot one, pretty good sized, redhead. I, I, I might stand out, you could say. So sometimes people want to take pictures. Other times they're staring, and then when I catch their glance, they look down. And then one guy who was a shopkeeper this, this time around as I was walking past his shop tried to beckon me inside, as a lot of shopkeepers will do, and he said, Hey, big boss, come here, big boss. <laughs> I said, Thank you, but no thank you. And I kept walking, but big boss. You know, I felt maybe I didn't belong. Did I belong? Did I belong among this group of people? But something hit me one night as I was there in what's considered a tuition center. You can see the, the picture in front of you is a group of children numbering between 30 and 40. They are kids who are impoverished. They're in pretty poor families. And what has been established for them at two different locations are called tutoring centers or tuition centers where they can get help five nights a week, Monday through Friday, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And they're, they're supplied with a, a tutor who, who, who helps them with their schoolwork, who teaches them lessons so that they can learn the English language, teaches them stories and songs about the Bible and what Christ has done, and then at the end of the evening feeds them a meal, usually rice-based and come along with an egg or another source of protein. I'm reminded of a a Tamil phrase that says, one will never go hungry by feeding too many people. And that's what we're seeking to do in India, to feed people not only God's Word that is for their souls, but also something that will help them in their lives, whether it's learning English or learning how to sew, that they might be equipped in both body and soul. As we stood there among this group of children this night, they had to stand up and recite things before Pastor Raji, who is the CEO and the founder of Calvary India Mission. So the kids would each stand up as their name was called, and they'd either have to recite the ABCs or count from 1 to 10 or share a Bible passage or read a portion of a story in their workbook. One kid was called to stand up and recite these ABCs. And he got going, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K... And then he stopped, and he froze, and he couldn't continue. And I saw him as he was, as he was told to sit down and with a look of embarrassment and shame on his face. And he sat down, and we all know this feeling when we don't get something right, and he was fiddling around with his workbook a little bit, and he was just kind of feeling depressed and down. And I kept looking at this kid. And as the evening went on, more of the kids were asked to make recitations, and a lot of them would mess up, and it was okay. And gradually I saw that this child started to change his countenance, and he looked up, realizing he wasn't alone in not being able to recite the ABCs. And when I caught his eye, I gave him a wink, and I smiled at him, and he smiled back. And as you see from the next picture that I took with him, I found that the smile of this young man named Yane Ganesh was an awful lot like the smile of my son Noah. And so when I looked at this child who has a very different color of skin and a very different color of hair and a different kind of clothing than my son has, for the rest of the night I no longer saw Yane Ganesh, but I saw Noah. I saw my own child. And I have to wonder, is that how God looks at us? that when we are looked at by God through the lens of the cross, He doesn't see us who look so differently from Him, but instead He sees His Son. 
And in his son, he sees us as his sons, as his daughters, as his children, because he is a loving heavenly father. And if that is how God can look at me, sinful though I am, how much more can I also look at other people cleansed by the blood of the Lamb because I'm looking at them through the lens of the cross? That when we look at others, we would see them as God sees them, as His children because of His Son, Jesus Christ. At the end of my time in India, we got to speak and celebrate the inaugural service of this new building that's being built. It's not completely done yet, but we still took a moment to welcome in the new students who are going to be trained there. We celebrated what's happening, posed for pictures afterwards, and shared with them the message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. One of the young ladies who is going to be in the second batch of students had asked me during the interview process. She said, why are you doing this? Why have you come all the way from America to offer this tailoring center here? And as I told the group of students that day at this inaugural service, that it's because of Jesus is why we're here. Not to make money, not to make a difference for our own names, but to lift up His name so that people can see who Christ is and what He has done for them. So that through providing for your needs and lifting you up, you would lift up your eyes and see your God who makes all things new. So that from the outside at night, you can see the cross is shining. That there is light shining in the midst of of the darkness, that there is a light that shines in the midst of the darkness in India, and that light is named Jesus. And that same light that shines halfway across the world is also the light that shines here in the darkness of our lives, and His name is Jesus. That the cross is the lens by which God looks at you, and the cross becomes the lens by which we learn to look at others as our fellow children of God. Friends, as Paul writes, the message of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God.